Trying to understand how electronic devices work, especially when the inside of a simple transistor radio looks like this, can be pretty frightening. And you can't really blame anyone for thinking it's all too complicated. Too many bits and pieces and loads of wires and gadgets. But one of the beaut things about electronics, however, is that when you get down to it, even complicated circuits like these are often made up of no more than a dozen different types of components. Capacitors, resistors, diodes, transistors, transformers, and integrated circuits. Now, very briefly, capacitors store electrical charges. The higher the capacity, the greater the electrical charge they can store. Resistors, as their name implies, resist the flow of electricity current. And here are some of the three different types of diodes we use. All of them let current flow in only one direction. Now, this one here is an LED. Now, that stands for light emitting diode. And when a current flows through it, it glows. We'll be using one of these little fellas very shortly. Now, these are transistors, and they come in a huge variety of shapes and sizes. They're the modern equivalent of valves and can act as very fast switches. As a rule, they have three connections. When the right current is applied to the center lead, they switch on, and current can flow through the two other leads. The amount of current flowing depends on the amount of current applied to the central lead. Now over here, transformers also come in a variety of shapes and sizes, depending on the job they have to do. These are audio transformers used in radios. They transfer electrical signals from one section of a circuit to the other, while keeping the sections isolated from each other. Now these are integrated circuits, ICs as they are often called, and they are truly one of today's electronic miracles. One of these devices can contain almost every circuit required in a radio receiver with all the necessary connections miniaturized to such a degree that this little fellow here contains the equivalent of 200 or 300 components. Now, whether you're building a model airplane, a boat, or even a house, you need a plan. And this is a plan of an electronic device. The lines represent the connections between various components, and each component is represented by a symbol. The first step in recognizing the various components is quite simple. Now, the wiggly line here indicates a resistor. Here is a capacitor. The plus sign shows it's polarized. That means it must only be connected in one way. Now, many components are polarized, as you'll see later. Now, if they are incorrectly connected, they won't work and could cause damage. These are transistors. They are also polarized, and incorrect connection quite often destroys them. This is the connection between this resistor and this transistor. The little bridge here over the other connection means that the two connections are not joined. When two connections do join, we use dots. This is a transformer. It shows two coils and a central core. Now, this coil is connected to a network of four diodes. Watch out for this diamond-shaped arrangement of diodes. It's used in many circuits. The two circuits, each side of the transformer, are isolated from each other. OK, now, the science of electronics began many years ago the first transistor being created in 1947. Now, some of the components in those days were very different from those we have today. Valves were used instead of transistors, for instance. But things like resistors and capacitors were basically the same. Now, to make any device, they all have to be connected in the right way. And in those days, electronics hobbyists used to join things together using screws and a piece of wood called a breadboard. That's exactly what we do today with these kits, except our breadboard is made of plastic. Now, you just stick the appropriate circuit diagram on over the guide holes, which take the holding screws. Now, along with screws and washers, we have a selection of capacitors. They hold an electric charge, and some of them can only be connected in one way. Now, they're polarized, remember that. So are these diodes, including the LEDs, which emit light. There's a collection of resistors and a number of items, including a loudspeaker and various connecting wires. Now, as I said earlier, we need a plan, a circuit diagram. And using these components, we can build any one of the 20 projects in this book. Now, 
I've only skimmed over what each component does, how it works and what symbols are used to represent it because the first few pages of the book do all this in much more detail. It's really worth studying this section thoroughly before you actually start building. As well as recognizing what each component is, we have to identify its value. How much resistance does it provide? What capacity is it? That's covered in this section on component marking codes. The current bands, dots, letters and figures found on different components are fully explained here. Drawings of every project show how the components will look when assembled. The circuit corresponding to the layout is included along with a list of different components required and instructions for assembly. There's an explanation on how the circuit works and ideas on what you can do next. Each successive project builds on what you have learned from the previous ones. And in case you get confused with our technical terms, there's a list of these at the back of the book to help you. Finally, there are separate diagrams for all the projects designed to fit exactly onto the breadboard. Now let's start with project number, number three, a water indicator. Now first up, we cut out the circuit from the back of the book and paste it on the board, making sure it's smooth and firmly stuck. Once that's done, select all the components you're going to use and double check that they're the right ones. Because the circuit diagram has been deliberately drawn with the connections and components exactly the way they'll be assembled, building is really straightforward. Each component fits over its own symbol, but to start construction, we first join up the wire links. Now make sure the wire is well wrapped around the screw and under the washer when you tighten it up. There's an old saying in electronics, your circuit is only as good as your connections, so take care. There's no need to screw too tightly at first, as other connections will be made to the same point at a later time. Once the links are in, start on the components. On this project, the two resistors are next. Check once again that the values are correct. When you tighten up this time, make sure that both wires are under the washer and firmly held. When you connect the diodes, remember that they're polarized and have to be connected the right way around. Otherwise, the circuit won't work. The band on the diode indicates the cathode or negative connection. The other is the anode or positive connection. The symbol shows clearly the arrow indicating the direction in which the current flows. If by accident the power supply to a circuit is reversed, a lot of damage, particularly to transistors and ICs, can result. Now when used like this, the diode prevents such damage by blocking the current. It's therefore referred to as our protection diode. When the distance between two screws is much shorter in length than the connecting legs of a component, the extra lead can be cut off or twisted clear of the other wires or components. The light emitting diode, or LED, is next. Now, LEDs are polarized, and the longer of the two connections is the anode or positive connection, so make sure it's connected up correctly. Now for the transistor. This is the heart of the circuit, and as you recall, it acts rather like a switch. Current applied to one lead allows current to flow across the other two leads, so it's important to identify the correct leads. Once they are known and recognized, the transistor can be fitted and the circuit completed by attaching the battery leads and the two probe leads. Now for the big moment. Right, now the circuits are all checked out. Let's see if it's ready to go. Now, oh, we'll need power, of course, so I've connected up a nine volt battery. Now, the book tells us that when the probes are placed in damp soil, the LED light will light up. The insulation at the end of the wires have been removed, allowing the bare wire to connect with the soil. Now, let's see if it works. In we go. Ah, oh, nothing yet. So, we'll add a few drops of water. And we'll wait a few seconds for it to seep in, maybe a couple more. And there we go, it works. It actually works. But why does it work? Well, the power from the battery flows up here through the limiting resistor, then flows down one of the probe leads into the soil. 
Now, whereas normal water is an insulator, water with a bit of soil in it or any other impurity actually conducts electricity. So it can run across the probe into the other probe and up into the middle of the transistor here. And do you remember what happens when current is supplied to the middle leg of the transistor? Current actually flows into the transistor to the other leads and runs through to the LED and the LED lights up. It's a funny thing about electronics. Once the bug bites you, it becomes very exciting. Simply by adding a few components, you start understanding a lot more about how things work and you build more exciting devices. So why don't we try something different, something a little more ambitious? How about a radio with a difference? A radio powered by beer. Now, this may not look like the typical capacitor you're used to using, but it does the job. It stores electrical energy. Only this is a variable one, called a variable capacitor, because you can vary the amount of energy it stores. There's a little integrated circuit and a tiny radio transformer and a resistor. And we have some more capacitors of different types, a little earpiece and a ferrite rod aerial that allows you to concentrate the radio waves and means you don't need a separate aerial. Now, I've got one nearly finished here. And as you can see, there's a lot of wire links here, two of them cross. Now, we use a piece of insulated wire for the lower link. This prevents accidents and short circuiting. The ends of insulation have been bared, of course, to make proper connections to the screws. There and there. Right now, to fit the variable capacitor, bend the three lugs up and then attach them beneath the three screws. Now be careful when doing this and make sure the washers and any overhanging links are not touching. Just tighten up firmly, not too tight, and then once secure, fit the tuning wheel and screw it to the shaft. The integrated circuit is a polarized device. Incorrect connections will usually ruin it. So identify the correct leads before you put it in. Remember what the triangular IC symbol tells us? That's right. That's where the IC goes. And in this case, the IC is being used as an amplifier. Now this is how the whole thing works. The ferrite rod aerial picks up and concentrates radio waves which produce tiny electrical currents in the coils. To tune in a station, we must select one of the small currents in the variable capacitor. The selected current is passed into the integrated circuit where it's processed, converted from radio frequencies to audio frequencies, which, after being amplified, pass along the output wire towards the earphone. The earphone converts these electrical currents into sound waves so that you can actually hear them. OK, here comes the interesting part. Three two-cent coins, three iron nails, some paper clips, and wire. And we have the basis of our power supply. Wouldn't believe it, would you? Now, to fasten the paper clips, first bear the ends of the wire and then slip the coins and nails into position under the clips. As the copper coins will become the positives in our power supply and the iron nails the negatives, it's a good idea to connect one of the coins to the red wire and one of the nails to the black wire. When connecting the power supply to the radio, always remember this sequence. Negative terminal to the nail, then a coin, which is a positive, connected to a nail, which is a negative, and then a coin, connected back to a nail again, and a positive terminal, which is the coin, is connected back onto the positive of the radio. I always remember N for negative is N for nail. It makes it easier. OK, circuit's checked. Let's pour in the beer. Here we go. Now, what we've really built are three small power cells, each producing a small electrical current through a chemical reaction between the copper, the iron, and the beer. And we need three cells because the amount of power produced by each is quite small. 
Now, as the beer reacts with the coin and the nails, it becomes polluted. So um, when you're finished with it, don't drink it straight away. Now, power output from each cell will be reduced if the paper clips holding the coins touch the beer. So let's adjust the wires to avoid this, like so. There we are. I'll check that one. That's fine, too. Now, full power is reached in about one minute. And there it is, a beer-powered radio that actually works. Remember how we talked about joining up individual components to make a particular circuit? Well, most electronic devices consist of a number of circuits linked together to make the one large device. For example, if we take our beer radio, we can connect it to one of the other projects, say a two-transistor amplifier, and make an even bigger and better radio. Now, we won't need the earphones, so we remove it and connect the input leads of the amplifier in its place. You'll find, by the way, that when you're first building circuits, there's a great temptation to hurry, especially when you're getting near the end. So this is when you'll probably make mistakes, so take it nice and slowly. Now, clamp the screws on strongly to connect the amp up to the radio. In this case, we'll need a separate power supply to drive the amp. We could possibly drive the amp on many beer-powered cells, but it's far better to use a little battery to do it. The radio is still being powered by the beer, of course, but for the amp, we're using a 9-volt battery. So, select the station, well, we already have, and adjust the volume. And away we go. I hope you find experimenting with electronics projects as much fun as I do. If you take it step by step, learn to recognize individual components and what functions they perform, complicated circuit diagrams and complex circuit boards won't seem quite so daunting and very soon will begin to make sense. Now once you've completed all the projects in the Funway 1 series, there are bigger and better kits to be found at your Dick Smith Electronics store. Then you'll be well on your way to building a most rewarding career or hobby along the fun way into electronics.